Uh, so, Katerina Filiu, a curator, a researcher, PH, um, PhD student, graduate student in the University of Palermo right now. She was born in Odessa. Uh, I got to know her through her activities in the Isolatia um, space in Kiev a few, a few years back. Um, she's of the young generation, the youngest generation of bright, of brilliant curators from Eastern Europe. Uh, and um, she's our first expert talker. You know. um, ICA is a partner in the Western Balkans project of Manifesta 14, of which Western Balkan project, funded by the Creative Europe um, program of European Union, there are several partners all over the Balkans. Some are from uh, Pristina or from uh, Tirana, from Belgrade, and so on and so forth. Initially, uh, this Western Balkan project uh, was meant to, to, be, to consist for each partner in two, uh, of two parts. One expert talks, panel discussions, and then a parallel event, uh, something like an exhibition or so. Uh, we uh, decided to do the expert talks uh, first, and this is, uh, Katerina is the first speaker. Then we will have a speaker from uh, Sarajevo, El Mahodzic. We will have a speaker from Berlin, now teaching in Istanbul, uh, Sonia Lau Abraham, who is an expert in um, uh, art and the, and the legal structure, and we will have a speaker from Plovdiv via Moscow, Be Beijing and London, namely this is uh, Snežana Krstova, who is a senior curator at Garage Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in Moscow, uh, which at the moment is not functioning for obvious reasons. Uh, the expert talks that the general, the umbrella title is uh, Curating the End Game, uh, Pain, Guilt and Empathy, and uh, we will try to figure out how, you know, in, in this very grave situation that you know, basically Ukraine found itself in, and not only Ukraine, but all of, all of every, everybody who's somehow involved uh, in one way or another, it's, it, it's a game changer for Europe, for the world, and we need to think um, about what we do at this, in this moment as artists, curators, and so on. Uh, the other speakers will address the, the basically the, the, the general uh, the key word here is empathy. It's not it's neither guilt or pain alone. It is empathy. And uh, the, the, why we have a speaker from Sarajevo because um, Elma Hodzic went through the siege of Sarajevo and during the war uh, when ex Yugoslavia was falling apart more than twenty years ago. And uh, we will try to, to somehow address the, this very difficult situation. The, the second part of, 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 what, of ICA's involvement with uh, Manifesto 14 is, uh, will take place in Pristina, Kosovo, in the space of the Faculty for Fine Arts. And it's, a, it's an exhibition under the title of self planning with subtitled Tribe of Empathy. And it consists of more than 20 uh, artists, uh, all of them residing or living and working in Bulgaria, but not all of them are uh, ethnic Bulgarian and uh, Bulgarian born artists. This will be um, announced shortly, maybe next week, with, with a special uh, ICA sponsored announcement, and it is part of the official program of Manifesta in Pristina. So now, without uh, any uh, with, with no further ado, Katerina Fidiuk, uh, the floor is yours. Good evening everyone, my pleasure to be here, it's uh, my first time in Bulgaria, although as uh, Luchizar mentioned I'm from Odessa so we are basically neighbors, but this I guess is the irony of uh, these neighboring countries in uh, Eastern Europe and in, in, in Balkans that sometimes we don't know each other that well, although we are very close to each other. Um, today I will uh, talk about uh, one particular pro project uh, that I curated uh, with Isolatia, which Luchazar also mentioned. Uh, Isolatia, I have to do this short uh, introduction because uh, it's really important for what I'm going to say later. Uh, Isolatia Platform for Cultural Initiatives was uh, founded in 2011 in Donetsk. Uh, in 2014 the institution had to leave. Uh, it was basically forced uh, uh, eviction. 
And uh, since then, uh, the premises of Izolace in Donetsk, there is a secret prison uh, where people are uh, kept and tortur tortured by the so-called Donetsk People's Republic authorities. Uh, and Izolatia for all these years, uh, already from Kiev, from its new headquarter in Kiev, uh, advocated for uh, investigation and uh, in general for uh, um, yeah, some sort of uh, uh, justice for, for people who are kept there, who kept there and um, for the for people who uh, who organized this uh, this prison um, in uh, 2019 uh, we decided uh, as isolatia because back then i was a uh, chief curator of, of this institution uh, we decided to move to eastern ukraine again uh, because Mm, Izolatia is originally from there because even being in Kyiv uh, we always uh, had interest in this region. There was a program called uh, Donbass Studies, uh, so we never ever actually abandoned uh, uh, Eastern Ukraine and uh, this tiny uh, town of Solidar was chosen as a, as a new, new location for the institution. Um, crazy choice, one may say, 1,100,000 population, so 11,000, excuse me, 11,000 population, so it's a, it's a, it's a tiny town. Um, it's a company town, so it's building out uh, around one industry, uh, the salt mines, and uh, when we arrived there, there was nothing. Like, literally, the, there was a house of culture, but I, mean, I will talk about that maybe a little bit later, also showing some uh, images. And why I think uh, this project is relevant uh, and why I decided to, to share it uh, with you is because uh, I think this keyword empathy is something that was a keyword for us when we decided to move there. Uh, and I would add another word, which is care, because uh, uh, operating there uh, required from, uh, from the institution and from all the people involved uh, uh, a lot of care, a lot of uh, uh, enthusiasm and a lot of empathy. Uh, and it wasn't uh, an easy... Uh, it wasn't an easy move, uh, neither for an institution nor for the people who worked there, nor for the for the um, residents of this town. Because, uh, of course, at the beginning uh, we were considered to be I don't know aliens, uh, Russian agents, uh, uh, spies, uh, uh, people who arrived there to uh, to somehow uh, to to make a raider attack on the on this uh, uh, company on Artyom Sol, uh, which, uh, which is a huge enterprise, governmental enterprise, so there were numerous attacks on it uh, um, and numerous uh, um, attempts to privatize it, because it's, it's, it's the biggest uh, producer of uh, uh, salt uh, uh, and also for industrial, uh, for industrial use. Uh, in, in in Eastern U uh, Europe, not only in uh, in Ukraine, um, and I will start from uh, one video, which we made uh, as as Isolatia made uh, to start our work uh, in uh, Solidar. So this is it's very short.
by the way, this video was made by uh, Zoya Laktivo Laktionova, whose video you may have seen uh, at the National Gallery as part of the Ukrainian uh, video program. Um, so yeah, as you can see, it's a very interesting uh, landscape, um, man-made, but also uh, natural. Um, and uh, what were the reasons for Isolatia to, to move there? Because one would say well, it's, it's insane from Kiev to, to a small town in the middle of nowhere. Um, well, the reason was at the beginning you saw that uh, back then uh, th there were 20 kilometers from this place to the, to the front line. Uh, now actually the situation is that uh, uh, Solidar can be occupied by the Russian troops any day, any, wh while we are talking, um, something may happen. Uh, from 11,000 people who lived there, there are around 3,000 left in the town, everyone else uh, managed to escape. Uh, and and uh, those who left, they uh, for weeks already stay in, in the basements because uh, there are heavy uh, bombing uh, of the entire area, uh, which strategically is kind of very important for Russians. So um, we hope, of course, that uh, it's not going to be occupied, but uh, the reality is that probably it's going to be occupied. Um, so this uh, already, uh, by uh, like very consciously, we would wanted to put ourselves in a position where we are very close to uh, to the front line, uh, where we work with people who. Uh, and Solidar uh, was uh, temporarily occupied, but very briefly uh, in uh, 2015, uh, so uh, 14. Uh, so uh, they had this experience already, uh, and we uh, thought that culture uh, could be something that can help this community uh, to overcome the trauma uh, but related to war, but also to find their uh, way to navigate a little bit their way outside of this very narrow vision that they have about the uh, this monotown uh, situation, no? because there are dynasties, the people who work at the salt mines for uh, generations and generations, and do they don't see any alternative. They, uh, uh, oh, you either leave, uh, stay there, or uh, and you work at the salt mi or mine, or you leave. So we wanted to introduce to, to introduce this. Uh, um, alternative and to show that uh, actually uh, previously industrial regions, many industrial regions in the world then chose this uh, path of like creative industries and uh, uh, it was quite, there were many successful cases. Um, then we were quite interested in this juxtaposition of nature. This is this um, iconic Ukrainian step. When we t talk about Ukraine, we often think about uh, uh, step, and then this uh, thing that was called uh, back in the centuries Dike Pole, uh, so kind of no man's land, uh, which considered to be absolutely empty. Uh, there were no settlements, which is not true when we learned it also while we started working. Uh, on our research, uh, we learned that, of course, uh, Soviet uh, uh, vision of this region was that only with the arrival of the uh, of the Soviets, uh, the industrialization started, and that was the beginning of, uh, uh, let's say, the renaissance of this era, and before there was nothing. In, in reality, it's not true, because there were many Ukrainian settlements, uh, then there was the first wave of, of industrialization led by Belgians, uh, um, British and uh, Dutch people. Uh, and when the Soviets arrived, they actually used the infrastructure that was already there. 
that was already built by uh, the um, foreigners. So, for instance, there was the first and the longest back then uh, salt uh, pipe uh, uh, built between uh, Solidar and Lysychansk because in Lysychansk one of the factories used uh, this salt water uh, for the production and uh, they uh, constructed uh, this uh, huge uh, system which later on was used by the Soviets and uh, now in 2000 it was completely destroyed and dismantled and uh, it doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, all these uh, uh, industrial stories that we uh, discovered talking to people there, um, it, of course, created even more curiosity and even more desire to, to work there. And also the uh, biodiversity that exists there. And uh, one, when uh, someone talks about uh, uh, Donbass and about Eastern Ukraine, probably this is not something that you uh, you have as a first thought, like uh, that it's uh, rich uh, and interesting, like flora and, and fauna, but in reality it's like this. Um, so to start properly, I say, I wanted to start with this uh, with this quote from Katerina Batanova, a recent uh, text uh, she published. Uh, at the website called Various uh, uh, Artists. There are three texts that she wrote, it's like a trilogy that she wrote about the uh, current situation in Ukraine. And I, if you're interested, I highly recommend you to, to read these texts because uh, they uh, each text picks, picks a particular uh, element of the big system and uh, uh, describes it uh, very well and analyzes it very well. Uh, so sh here she talks about extreme care as something that uh, Ukrainians uh, in general, but also uh, Ukrainian artists adapted uh, after the revolution of dignity. Uh, and uh, this, I guess, was our uh, driving engine as well when we decided to, to move to Solidar. Um, the title of my talk was a little bit provocative and uh, indeed uh, after three, three years working with Solidar and in Solidar I haven't been there and it's, uh, it's like, yeah, what can I say, there was uh, Covid, uh, I, I, I had a baby, uh, so there was this all this coincidence of, of, uh, of different factors that didn't allow me to go there and it's also uh, not so easily um, reachable because uh, you need to go by train from Kiev uh, to one of the biggest, uh, closest big cities, uh, which is something like 13 hours uh, trip, and then to take a bus to go to Soledar. Uh, so it's also not that easy to to get there. Although I have to say that I have a feeling that I know this town very well, because before starting doing something there, we decided that we need to uh, to understand who is our audience and uh, what are we going to do there because it was obvious that we not we cannot just take the program that we had in Kiev in the capital of, of Ukraine where there are many art institutions and it's very competitive and you always have to invent something new otherwise no one will come and just put it in in Solidar where people have no idea what what is this, a contemporary art? Why do we need it? And, you know, uh, so we spent about a year uh, researching, so we didn't do anything there. Uh, we interviewed people, we tried to uh, work with the archives, uh, we reached uh, to Artyom Sil, which of course was very hostile because they were like, oh, uh, who are they? they? You know, we have this kind of this status quo here and, and they come and this might be a potential danger. Um, we uh, found some uh, activists there who later on became uh, members of our team, of our local uh, team there. 
uh, we made a doc, like an internal document, which later on we also um, revised and it became a sort of a guide for the artists who uh, would go there, which uh, talked about uh, different aspects of this town, the history, uh, the, the industry, nature, people, communities, uh, archives that, uh, that you f can find there. So, uh, you know, all, all these things that, uh, that we're usually interested in. Uh, and only after that, uh, we decided that our first project will be a series of long-term, uh, short-term uh, residences for Ukrainian artists. And because this was a moment, uh, uh, 2020, which COVID was, when COVID was, the, uh, was still there, uh, so international travels were not uh, possible. But actually, I'm very happy that international travels were not uh, possible because it gave an opportunity to Ukrainian artists and also uh, this exchange, uh, like the, the language question, the mentality, was much, much more fruitful, uh, in my opinion, with the Ukrainian artists. Um, so there were 19 artists or art collectives, uh, which we hosted uh, within the span of uh, five months six, five months. So the, usually the residence would be something like one week. Uh, of course, it's not enough to produce a work, but the idea was not to, you know, to ask them to, to produce a work in one week. Uh, and someone managed, someone, someone didn't, someone is still working and would like to come back. Uh, Zoya Laktionova, for instance, uh, went there three times. Once she was a resident, once she filmed this, uh, uh, this video that, that showed you at the beginning, and then she continued to come back because she was just uh, interested in, uh, in what she saw there. Uh, so the, uh, all the photos that I'm going to show now are the photos from the, from the residency program, uh, the residence. And also, again, uh, not being there, uh, I felt kind of guilty <laughs> and uh, I tried to be as much helpful as, as possible to the artists, uh, for the artists, but also uh, to uh, kind of train our local team there because the idea was that we don't want to be, you know, these missionaries who come and say, okay, guys, we know how to do everything. Uh, we're going to teach you now. Uh, we're going to do everything ourselves. Uh, there are all these working models that we're going to introduce you. Uh, and then you just uh, stay mute and, and follow. Uh, that was absolutely not the case. Uh, so there was continuous dialogue with the local team uh, and exchange because uh, certain things I learned from them, certain things maybe they learned from me. Um, and uh, this, I guess, was the, uh, the this kind of kind of successful combination. And again, this uh, expression of, of, of care and, and like mutual uh, respect. Uh, and uh, so how, how we worked? We worked in a way that before the residency, I had the long conversation with each resident coming uh, to Soledar. Then during the residency, we tried to have a couple of sessions all together with the local team. And then at the end, we asked each resident to uh, send uh, us uh, their feedback about uh, their experience on a very practical level. Uh, let's say, I don't know, there is no cafe where I can go have uh, have a coffee or they don't have soy milk uh, in this only cafe. Because there is one cafe. There is like one pizzeria, one cafe, uh, a couple of supermarkets. This is also something that we learned when the vegan artist went there. That was a nightmare because <laughs> it was like she, she had nothing to eat there, like literally. Um, but these are the things, you know, that also like from this mundane experience, they're also important. So we asked people to share these kind of experiences with us, but also to share on a, on a more like uh, yeah, conceptual level, let's say. And what we learned almost at the beginning 
uh, that people, for instance, in Solidar, they don't use Facebook and Instagram that much. So these means of communication were absolutely useless. Like it, it was, it, it had no sense to post something on Facebook because no one local would ever see that. Although uh, instead they were they were using uh, Telegram channels. So we had to uh, first create our Telegram channel uh, and second uh, ask local people to invite us to the channels that they were using. So this was the way to communicate with local people. And uh, the first residence, uh, this young artist uh, from uh, from Kiev, uh, they all b both have uh, their background in sociology. For them, it was like a nightmare. They said, no, this community, we don't know how to work with this community. It's just you have to be you have to be an insider to somehow they wanted to have a workshop with them to kind of um, introduce this idea that you can have a public discussion about something. But again, something that we learned quite quite often that people don't have a space where they can have a discussion. Because as I said, there is one cafe, uh, meaning that there is no culture to, to go have a coffee with a friend. Uh, so all discussions and all conversations, where do they happen? They happen at home, uh, maybe in the kitchen, I don't know, with, with your uh, family members, maybe with some close friends, but this is a very small circle. And of course, if you want to have uh, to implement certain changes and you want the community be, to be involved in these changes, it's, uh, uh, you, you need a bigger circle of people. You need to create uh, an opportunity for them to, to get together and to, to share and to, to uh, talk to each other. Uh, so obviously this was also very different from what we uh, what we experienced before what we knew before uh, as you can see everyone almost everyone who went there all artists they were extremely interested in salt a uh, couple of uh, yeah, couple of uh, um, workshops where they work with salt the solidar is also famous for their salt lamps uh, as souvenirs and before they were all uh, maybe you saw in the video there was, there was the shelf a shell with uh, with the pearl inside uh, but of course now in the recent years they started to make like tanks or uh, yeah Ukrainian symbolic and uh, you know war made an imprint also on, on this uh, um, on, on this sphere. Uh, so uh, our office, we opened a small office there. Our office at the beginning was also perceived with a lot of like, yeah, well, no, not hostile, but suspicious as for sure. Uh, and then we, we thought, okay, but how can we kind of bring people, how can we explain them that they are welcomed, you know, that uh, that it's okay to drop in, it's okay to um, to say hi, to ask something, to maybe to see something there in the office. Uh, and again, after a series of conversations with locals, we, we realized that the only way to do it is to uh, have something for kids, some practical workshops for kids, because they usually come with their parents. And uh, through the kids, you can involve the parents and you can involve the, uh, the older generation. And indeed, it worked like this because parallel to, to the residency program, we had always some uh, certain activities for, uh, for kids. And slowly, uh, people started to, to come. Uh, and uh, um, they were, well, maybe less suspicious, less afraid uh, and at some point it became kind of a habit so people would just come by say ah hello how are you uh, what's uh, what are the, your plans like what what gonna be next we, we are interested so um, this was very nice but it took us I think a year and so one year of preparation then the first year of uh, working there actively and then we had kind of our audience after after that time 
Um, so I mentioned already before that uh, uh, there were uh, um, British, uh, Dutch and Belgium uh, col colonizers <laughs> or uh, businessmen who came to Donbass. Uh, and here you see uh, the ruins of uh, of the old factories that uh, almost nothing uh, survived uh, the Soviets and then the 90s because uh, uh, ironically probably more uh, industrial objects were destroyed in the 90s than uh, than ever before uh, just because uh, of the economical reasons that no one really took care of it and here you see one of the artists who uh, created a soundscape of, uh, of Solidar, Nazari Zanos um, and uh, he visited different places also uh, this uh, salt workshop and uh, recorded the, the sound of uh, these uh, blocks of salt being uh, cut. Uh, this is a group called Open Space. What they did was research uh, about the factories that indeed disappeared uh, in the 90s completely because there was a series of manipulations, uh, privatization, etc., etc., and it ended up very badly, and the, the huge uh, factory was destroyed uh, completely. Uh, but what they did, they worked with a group of uh, teenagers um, on the documentary movie about this factory, but the teenagers uh, had their rock band rock and rap, yeah, two different styles, but nevertheless. Uh, and they asked the artist, can you help us to uh, produce our first music video? Uh, so the co collaboration uh, went in this direction. They were working on two videos simultaneously. Uh, one was the, the documentary, which they filmed in the, in the museum, uh, among other locations, and the other one was the, 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 video, uh, the, the video clip. And you see on the wall there, there is this uh, pieces of uh, paper, which is actually the, uh, how you say, the story, storyboard, storyboard of, the, of the music uh, video that they created. So we considered this kind of project uh, an, an exemplary one, the, the desirable one, because then at the end, uh, teenagers for the first time went to the museum. They didn't know about existence of this place. Uh, they learned about uh, the ruins that they pass by almost every day, and they didn't know that it was a factory. Uh, and they had a music video at the, at the end, so they were very satisfied and happy about this collaboration. And they learned some uh, practical skills on how to edit, how to how to film, how to you know uh, work with uh, with video. Uh, so for me, this is probably one of my favorite projects. Uh, this is more classical kind of uh, uh, thing because this, this was an artist, uh, Valentina Bero, uh, who created a sculpture uh, from from salt bricks. Uh, maybe she didn't engage that much with the local community, uh, but uh, she at the end created a, a beautiful, a beautiful work. This is Zoya Laktionova when she was filming there. Um, she also made a film about Solidar, a short film. Um, this is Vitaly Agapeev, who also made a, quite an interesting piece. Uh, he uh, made a, a sort of a map of Solidar, which, is which was uh, quite uh, accurate, but also kind of imaginary. And he used some elements. Uh, he's actually, um, he worked a lot as a, with graffiti. So uh, he, and he wanted to make a mural outside uh, somewhere outdoors, but uh, the weather was horrible. It was raining for one week. So uh, at the end, he ended up uh, making this uh, uh, canvas uh, painting because uh, this was the only way to. Uh, to make it. This is also another example of locals being 
uh, involved in making art projects because uh, uh, at some point uh, the, uh, the artist said, oh, I need, you know, some instruments. Uh, I, I won't be able to bring everything from Kiev. So can you find us a workshop or something or someone, maybe someone in a garage has, you know, a little bit of uh, this and that and some tools. And indeed we found this guy who's kneeing. Uh, on the photo, uh, and uh, he said, yeah, yeah, you can use my garage, I have some stuff there, so I'm happy to help. And then he got so much engaged and involved in, with, <laughs> in this project that, uh, uh, you know, he considered this it kind of his project. He was kind of a co-author co of, of, of that. And when uh, um, at the opening people came and, of course, uh, you can imagine of the very tra kind of traditional context. People saw these uh, sculptures. They were like, oh, "What's that? Uh, it's not very clear." And uh, the idea behind it was that uh, actually, why there is salt in this uh, in this area in this uh, quantity? Because uh, uh, the salt mines uh, are huge. Uh, there was a balloon uh, like flying inside of the of the tunnels of the of the salt mines. There is a, a football field there, a church, a museum. So everything underneath. Um, so you can imagine the the volume of 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 this uh, of these mines. Uh, the the reason why there's so much salt and it's like uh, two percent of all the uh, resources salt resources that have been extracted so far. So it's like endless uh, because there was a sea. Uh, and when it dried, uh, all this salt remained there. So the artist was appealing to these prehistoric times and talking, uh, making this uh, um, kind of fish-human uh, sculpture because obviously as uh, the sea was inhabited by uh, some sort of uh, fish and uh, yeah. Um, and this guy, uh, then he uh, helped us with many other projects. Um, he also he became very much uh, involved in what we do, and he really defended these uh, sculptures. So that when people were criticizing, he was like, "No, no, I will explain you now. You don't understand anything." <laughs> um, so it was also very, uh, very nice. This was a very uh, beautiful project. Uh, the artist uh, does this kind of uh, textile, so the natural uh, coloring of, uh, of textile. And uh, she asked the locals to bring her on the, uh, on the walk uh, and to show their uh, favorite uh, herbs and uh, uh, plants that uh, can only be found in uh, this area. Uh, so this was the walk. They collected all these uh, uh, plants and then she uh, also asked them to give uh, her an old, their old clothes and she uh, made this uh, beautiful prints uh, that uh, people were also, they, all, they felt uh, engaged uh, they shared suddenly it's not the artist who comes and says okay I know what I need to do that uh, you assist me but it's the artist who comes and says could you please show me your city the plants that uh, grow here and we can do something together so this of course this approach is very is very different and it was very much appreciated by uh, by the locals um, and the uh, uh, also by uh, by our team because uh, uh, it was also a very nice example of, of this like caring uh, and uh, very respectful um, relationships and collaboration between the artists and the, and the locals. This is Roxelana Dudka. Uh, she made uh, two murals on the walls of the House of Culture. And this is the house of culture nowadays. Um, and uh, Isolatia got uh, 
uh, a big structural funding from the European Union, uh, almost 1.5 million euro, I think, for two years uh, project in Solidar. Part of this project was to restore the House of Culture and part of it was to run the program there. Um, yeah, this is what happened to the House of Culture so far. Uh, but the European donors uh, were very flexible and they allowed Isolatia to repurpose a little bit, uh, the, uh, to, to reshape the, uh, the project. And now the money are uh, distributed in two ways. Uh, first, uh, people can apply. People whose uh, houses were destroyed can apply to get uh, um, basic things that they need. I don't know furniture, but also food, and you know. Uh, so it's like the humanitarian aid. And the second part is uh, for small organization, for small Ukrainian organizations who have who want to implement uh, small scale art projects to somehow help their communities, whether it's a community community um, in uh, eastern Ukraine or in zones where people had to had to move had to uh, escape uh, from the from the war uh, so this goes on and and this is basically if you ask me what is Alatia does now there are no art projects uh, they mainly deal with humanitarian aid and they um, help people in uh, mostly in small towns like Solidar to uh, um, bringing uh, some very essential things that are lacking there. So we invited a, um, a very promising young uh, uh, composer from Kiev, uh, Alexei Shmurak, and he, because there is this band which I mentioned already, and the guys from the band said, okay, said, okay because I was continuously asking, like, what do you want to do, what you're interested in? And the guys from the band said, mm, well, we would like to hear something about, you know, like a theory of music, you know, that someone helps us to navigate a little bit. And we invited this guy. Uh, he uh, had a couple of sessions with them um, where he indeed uh, explained some theoretical aspects, but he also showed them, you know, how to how to make music using whatever they they have. Um, and uh, there were also kids, so at the end of the session, the kids also wanted to participate, so it was a very, kind of a nice moment that uh, everyone enjoyed. Um, apart from uh, salt mines, uh, there's another big uh, company in the area, which uh, Knauf, which produces uh, Hipsum. And uh, these are the caves that remained after the excavation of uh, some of the of some of the resources, and uh, it became a, a backdrop for one of the videos, one of the artists uh, who has this very ironical uh, <laughs> approach, and he made a, a hilarious uh, um, a video about. Uh, a family of, uh, they were like dinosaurs or lizards or something like So there's like relict uh, animals who kind of used to live there in this area also in prehistoric times. And they somehow happened to, to, to be in contemporary Solidar and they continuously complain. So they say like, ah, but water doesn't work. And this politician is, you see, but in our times it was much better. And it was like super ironic because he was of course pointing out to real problems, to real issues, but through these like imaginary, uh, imaginary characters. And, uh, and then they lost their son. So it's a couple with a, with a baby. They lost their son and they were uh, going around trying to find him. So it's, it's, it's like a dramatic story, uh, but uh, very funny also. Uh, mm. They found it? Huh? They found it? They found it, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At, the, at the end. They, uh, he, he went to, um, uh, to Salt uh, Lake, uh, which Zoya Lactionova filmed, uh, which is called Pravalla because it's actually... Uh, um, I can't say man-made, but it's a result of, of uh, uh, man action. Because uh, uh, these are the 
the land that just the holes that were created in the land because they were excavating uh, underneath and then at some point the all these uh, empty spaces they kind of uh, synced, yes, and uh, uh, there, there are these uh, lakes that no one knows how deep they are also because it's impossible to kind of measure the depths of and uh, of course there's all these like local legends about, you know, someone who drowned in one lake and then the corp would like be found in another lake in one week or some, you know, the, the, some some stories like that always, of course, exist like a folklore, local folklore. But uh, uh, yeah, they found their son there. <laughs> uh, um, and then what I was saying that uh, you know when one uh, uh, talks about Donbas, probably you imagine uh, the the mines, the the pipes, the uh, terry cones of this used like uh, material. And etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, it's a very beautiful uh, um, area. There are many uh, national, uh, um, how you call them, resorts or uh, like uh, areas that are under protection uh, for its biodiversity. Um, it's very particular um, in a sense that. Uh, well, it's kind of a funny story. The founder of Izolacia, Luba, uh, Luba Mikhailova, she had this uh, idea of um, to commemorate the story of Izolacia in, Don in Donetsk, uh, to plant um, like a garden, to plant some trees. And she said, oh, maybe we can do it in Solidar. And then we started to talk to people. And, and then there was a, one guy who said, like, trees? But this is step, like trees are uh, like, they are uh, foreigners here, you know, the, 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 the trees do, do not grow here. It's like, it's flat, it's horizontal. There is nothing like vertical here. And we were like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, this is also, uh, so the idea with the, with the garden is, is still there, but obviously not in Solidar because of course we don't want to, you know, interfere with the with the natural landscape and uh, um, to put trees where they do not belong. Uh, um, uh, this was one of the, uh, our residents who is actually uh, kind of a journalist and a blogger, not an artist. Uh, she paired with a graphic designer, and uh, her blog is about uh, Donbass from the touristic perspective. So she uh, advertises, let's say, uh, the area, and uh, she made, uh, they made together at the end, they made a very be beautiful set of postcards. Um, but not only beautiful pictures, but also the stories behind it, and uh, it was very uh, uh, thoughtful and very nicely uh, done. This is her in the in uh, in the salt mine, um, and she uh, she was focused on all this. Uh, like natural beauties that you you can find uh, in the area. Mm. It was also very very nice. Um, this is another collective uh, which also worked there on their film. Uh, this is another example of how people were helping the artists to construct something and then defending it. Because again, some traditionalists were saying, like, what the hell is this? You know, <laughs> this is horrible. This doesn't represent our city at all. It was a, a lot of criticism, but uh, at this point, we were already we had already many sympathetics. Uh, so there were also people, def not us, but local people defending and saying that no, this is the, the angel of Solidar, it represents the city, uh, uh, he's an artist, this is the artistic vision, you know, uh, all these kind of things. Uh, they, they, they were educating uh, other people, not us anymore, and this was also uh, very important. And then on the back uh, you see uh, Culture Bus, which is another big project of Isolatia. The bus was traveling to 
a small uh, towns in uh, in Ukraine, uh, but uh, it was not a randomly chosen uh, place where where to go. But uh, um, the supposed to be an organization or a group of activists uh, that had to uh, apply for the bus to come to their place and they had to offer something. So for instance, bus brings an exhibition, a workshop, a uh, screening, but then a local organization has to organize, I don't know, a workshop as well or a concert or uh, any kind of activity. So it was not also the idea that we come and we bring something, but we come and we exchange and we kind of um, add uh, different elements to this program, uh, which also worked very well. And the last season was uh, of, of Culture Bus was uh, actually in uh, in the area around Solidar, uh, the smaller uh, villages uh, that most of them are or completely ruined now, or uh, almost almost uh, ruined. Uh, this was uh, the same artist who made the. Uh, Angel, uh, he asked people, uh, children mostly, uh, to uh, make these small uh, sculptures that uh, uh, will, would represent Solidar. So you see salt is, is everywhere. Salt is like the, the center of their universe. And they made all these uh, small uh, paper uh, models of uh, of kind of monuments that uh, that represent uh, Solidar. Uh, this was also super interesting. Uh, Katya Buchatska, she went there with a lecture about. Uh, I asked her because uh, I, I I realized that people do not really understand what what was that public art like why and then land art. And there were a couple of residents who uh, juggled with these terms. And, and I saw that people are uh, curious. Uh, so I asked Katya to, to give a lecture about public art and uh, land art. And uh, after the lecture, uh, so the one day there was a lecture, and next day there was a walk uh, in the area with people. And uh, Katya asked them to make uh, land art. And this is an example of land art made by uh, local people. You see there is this guy very like concentrated on, on building something. Uh, so it was a lot of fun, uh, as, as you can imagine, but also um, they uh, tried to uh, make it practical, you know, with this theoretical <laughs> knowledge that she shared with them, uh, they, uh, they tried to somehow implement. And this is the artist, uh, Katja Buchatska. Uh, this was an amazing event, very important for Solidar because the the first from the right is a Polish uh, curator and uh, uh, writer, Eva Sulik, and she wrote uh, a theater play called Animals Who Ate Their People about war in Donbass. And this was actually the first reading of this play uh, in Ukrainian, in Ukraine, I participated like this. This was my like the my particip my usual participation. <laughs> so the we were reading with local people this uh, this poem uh, with Eva, uh, and I mean this was extremely relevant and uh, uh, interesting for them uh, because it was about something that happened very close to them and they could uh, share this experience. But also, uh, there is this. Uh, there was this like twisted logic in in the in the uh, in the play uh, that at the end, like the dead animals were talking about people, and you know there was this constant exchange of roles. So it's a little bit surreal. But then also you uh, you completely uh, you are completely aware of what is all about and this. Uh, um, story of, of of war in Donbass, and on the on the back you see uh, also a beautiful project ba made by uh, Lia Dostleva and Andrei Dostlev, uh, which is called Leaking uh, War Wounds. Um, their friends, 
brought them a lamp from uh, not from Solidar but from Bakhmut, which is uh, near another um, city nearby. And they started uh, leaking this uh, this lamp, this salt sol uh, lamp. It took them four years. Every day they were leaking and taking a photo. It took them four years, and in four years there was nothing. So it was just a wooden platform and a, and a stick. And the idea was that when they finish leaking, the war maybe will be over. But they finished in, if I'm not mistaken, November or December. And in February, we all know what happened. So uh, we published uh, we published this project as a book because uh, uh, together with my husband, we run a publishing house in Palermo, uh, specialized on photo books. And uh, now it also exists as a book. But it's uh, actually it became. I mean, it was always relevant, but now it became became kind of extremely relevant and this uh, ex this project this exhibition is touring in Europe like I see it quite often <laughs> on, on Facebook that the guys post that it's in Germany it's in uh, I don't know in Lithuania it's in France etc um, and we presented this project also in, in Solidar um, this was the last event that took place in uh, Solidar in December. Uh, and this is an architect from Amsterdam, uh, Fulko Treffers, who uh, came there to work a little bit on a city plan and to suggest some simple but effective solutions to uh, change uh, people's experience in the city. So you see here that they uh, made some examples, some some photos uh, from other places, how uh, certain areas can, could be changed without spending huge amount of money, without uh, making a reconstruction that would last five years or something. Um, and it was again based on the on the daily experience of people. So you know uh, how you cut your way to go to the supermarket, although there is a, a normal road, but it's closer to go like this. So uh, what they were saying, they were not imposing another big master plan, but rather saying, okay, this path that you used to go to a supermarket could be, you know. Uh, changed a little bit, you can add some elements there and it will be very friendly and uh, uh, convenient for, for, for the users. And uh, again, local activists were in love with a couple of ideas. Uh, there is this Yurchishina Gara, Yurchishina kind of mountain from which you see the, the entire city. Uh, and it's a very nice area for uh, yeah, making barbecue, uh, for spending some time outdoors. And uh, um, the, the architects, they actually suggested a couple of very simple solutions, how to make it uh, uh, more co comfortable, the area. But unfortunately, nothing has been implemented because this was the, uh, yes, as I said, the last thing that happened there in um, in uh, December. And this is the photo that a colleague of mine, uh, none of them, none of our colleagues uh, remained there. They are all somewhere else. But they, of course, are in touch with, with people who left there. And they also organized the delivery of uh, humanitarian aid. This is the photo that she sent me yesterday, uh, the, the boy that uh, went to, to pick up uh, the humanitarian aid, some, some food. Uh, yeah, and this is the last, the last photo that I wanted to share with you. Of course, the future, what future brings, no one knows. Uh, we would like to, again, I say we, uh, even though I'm not that much involved with what Isolatia does anymore, um, Isolatia would like to, to come back to Solidar and continue working there. Uh, 
it looks like the institution has been displaced twice already. So first time from Donetsk and the second time from, from Solidar. Uh, I don't know, yesterday we were talking with uh, Luba Mikhailova and I told her, listen, I think we, we need to, it's time to make a book about it or, you know, because it's, uh, it's not uh, a normal, a history of a normal institution. It's, a, it's a, an institution that somehow echoes the, the, the history of the entire country. Uh, and there are so many displaced people in Ukraine and there are also Displaced, displaced institutions like Isolatia, and we all share this experience, um, and it totally makes sense to, to somehow, um, yeah, put it in in words, in in images, and and to share this story because, uh, I think it is, uh, it is very relevant, and uh, I'm actually proud of what we achieved uh, in Solidar because. Um, from the moment we arrived there and we were considered complete strangers that have to go away because we don't know a thing about this place and uh, uh, what we do is not interesting for them and uh, who knows, maybe we are agents who were sent there to, uh, to help to prioritize uh, uh, <laughs> privatize uh, Artyom Seal and you know from uh, from this kind of disposition, we arrived uh, to um, a moment when we created a very nice, small community of people uh, who were uh, looking f for something more than just, you know, waking up in the morning, going to the uh, salt mine, working there all day long, coming back home, and, you know, that's it. Um, and this is actually what happened in uh, in, Don, uh, in Donetsk as well, because uh, uh, Lia Dostleva, whom I mentioned, she said that one of her strongest uh, um, memories from uh, Izolatsia in uh, um, Donetsk that she once uh, took a bus to go there to one of the events, and uh, she suddenly realized that like. 80% of the people on the bus were going to Izolatsia and it was not in the city center so you had to, you, you, it was a commitment to go there and there was just this bus going there. And she said that I never ever before felt that I belong to a certain community in, in uh, Donetsk because Donetsk was also kind of a complicated industrial uh, city. Um, and I think this sense of, of, of community uh, is, uh, is the most important, important achievement at the end of the day. Because yes, it's, the, the, there are beautiful works that artists created during the residency, but for me they, they are less precious than, uh, than the community there. And I will finish with that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that people have the only kind of a social space where they can have debate is in the, with the family in the kitchen. Uh, did anybody of the visiting artists or, or residency have an idea to make like a communal kitchen, like a kitchen for more than people, for more than just one family? I mean, this is like something that comes to mind uh, within the context of contemporary art. Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, again, in the same way of connecting big and small, like local and global communities, it's like. Um, have, uh, has anybody <laughs> come up with an idea to, like, we have this uh, heritage of brotherly cities, cities like Rusyn, so mm -hmm. Bulgaria mm -hmm. with some city, Rostov, I don't know, GDR or something like that. It goes back many years. I mean, it's, I mean, it's like R, R, Rusy, Rostov, okay, it could be anything. But Solidar could become a, a brotherly city with Salt Lake City, where there is a spiral <laughs> jet in this, in this way to, con to connect salt and salt and art and art yeah. and Solatia. <laughs> Uh, the idea was when we were talking about restoring the, the House of Culture, the idea was of course that this will become also a meeting uh, uh, place for, for people because uh, uh, the House of Culture had a very traditional program 
uh, well, there was like an origami kind of uh, activity for kids and maybe, I don't know, something like uh, singing, but uh, not, not much, not, not more than this. And then when our director, the director of Isorazia, went, the, went there for the, one of the first times and was super hot and at some point she needed to use a bathroom and uh, she asked local people, what is there like a public bathroom? And they said, no, but you can go to the House of Culture because there is a bathroom over there. <laughs> and I remember uh, receiving this video from her uh, and she was like, uh, shocked, uh, sent, sent me this video filming the bathroom there. Well, you know, there were these holes in the, in the, on the floor and then that's, that's the bathroom, that's the public bathroom. So when she came back from this trip, she said, the first thing I'm gonna do is to build a decent bathroom in the house of culture because it's just impossible. Yeah, so this was in a way the... That's a problem in India. The idea. <laughs> How would you name, uh, I guess you applied for European funds, for example, so how would you name the activity? Because we started with the words empathy, uh, and you were talking about community, so Isolatia is doing what there? That's a very good question, uh, and that's actually a question which I was asking myself continuously. Uh, Somehow it happened in a very natural way. We were like reducing the number of exhibitions while investing much more in other types of activities, which are kind of hard to define because yes, what we are doing, we are doing a residency for artists, but our real goal is actually not to make art, not to, you know, to produce uh, 19 artworks because we had 19 artists and uh, 19 residents. It was more about uh, uh, pro providing or op creating opportunities for the locals. So each time we would write a grant, we were trying to kind of balance and to find the right wording. But uh, yes, it was much more about like, I'm not saying activism, but uh, it was, I, I think it was more like driving to, to in this direction rather than being a classical, I don't know, Kunsthalle kind of a model, no, that you exhibit, exhibit a lot, and uh, yeah, maybe there are some like accompanying uh, programs, but uh, your main activity is actually exhibition making. Um, and it, it depended, because this one, the big one that uh, a colleague of mine uh, won and uh, we were supposed to start implementing it, it was not about art at all. It was like an infrastructural uh, uh, grant, yeah. So it's like a community production and the context production. More, yeah, uh, more than, than art. Artistic. Yeah. Much and more the, the, the commodity for production. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, but but uh, as I understand, uh, you said it's a tiny city and so on. Even in the Bulgaria situation in Bulgaria, eleven thousand. It's not a tiny city. It's a city. Okay, it's a city. <laughs> All right. But um, as I understand, uh, there was uh, work for everyone there, no jobless people, there is uh, somehow an activity around these mines which as I understand are unique and needed and so on. Yeah. So it's again uh, as I felt it's a positive trend to the place or Say that uh, again after the revolution of dignity there was clearly this tendency and this uh, desire of this decentralization which became very very strong uh, in the last couple of years uh, so to name a couple of initiatives Google fest left yeah. and it's one of the biggest festivals uh, art it festival now? it left it had uh, one uh, iteration in Mariupol one there was a tr one there was kind of a train there was a, a festival on the train uh one where, where, where were they so they left kiev the last couple of years they were not in Is kiev the same anymore guy doing it? yes 
Vlad Trojski. Um, then um, the initiatives like, uh, I don't know, Pavlo Gudimov, who had his gallery in Kiev for uh, years and years and years, suddenly opened another one in Lviv. Um, there were suddenly so many small spaces uh, popping up in uh, uh, smaller cities. Uh, so it was clearly this desire and this uh, need to go outside uh, of this uh, bubble, because uh, of course Kyiv uh, in the last years became a very big, vibrant city with a lot to offer. And uh, it, it was also part of our thinking that why compete with another uh, 20 art institutions? Uh, of course we all are good in what we do, but uh, in Solidar we, what we do is much more uh, needed, you know, because there is nothing. There is a uh, the cinema and the shopping mall in is in the in Bakhmut, which is uh, like uh, what 30 minutes uh, by bus or something like this. Um, so, you know, even to go see a, a movie in a cinema, you have to go to another city, which for many people mentally just not that easy. Even though if you live in a big city, maybe 30, mm -hmm. 30 40 minutes is nothing for you to you know. To, to take a bus, so uh, this was also part of our our thinking, and of course it was it is positive, uh, and it has a big potential because the salt mines they are uh, part of them belong to a sanatorium, and there is this belief left from Soviet times that. Uh, uh, breathing this uh, uh, air, so air nice. is good for lungs. It's so from I uh, just did it. it. It's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there is a sanatorium uh, which was also destroyed. Uh, with my colleague uh, sent this uh, news uh, to us uh, like a week ago, and uh, there were tourists coming to see the the mines oh because of course they are yeah. amazing. The, it's, it's a huge touristic attraction. It's the the problem is that it's very hard to get there. And we were also thinking that in theory the, our next steps would be probably to work on this infrastructure and to make it more accessible. Uh, because even for, I had this very simple logistical pro problem for people who would uh, go there to, for a lecture, it's impossible to do it uh, if you're not staying there for two nights. Because you arrive, you have to stay there overnight, then you have an event next day, and then you have to leave early uh, uh, or very early, so you have to have an event like at uh, lunchtime, or if it's in the evening, then you can leave, cannot leave the same evening, you have to stay another, you have to stay another night. So it's like, you is know, like hotel? these are simple things. No, there is no hotel. There is no hotel. This but was how about the tourism? You mentioned tourism. Which they bring people the on the buses from Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. oh. And it's like a day trip. Mm -hmm. And of course it, it can be much more uh, uh, like sustainable if people maybe stay a little bit, no? But it's aesthetical tourism to see the beauties of the mines, yes. or it's more technical? No, 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 no. There is a museum, as I say, there is a church, there is a museum, there is this football field. So, yeah, it's just to, to admire the. Uh, football field for <laughs> soccer, for yeah. not to American football. No, no, no. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> yeah. The so, big field. But you so, can, so, the so, big field. You can play there. Yeah. Uh, uh, just to. to uh, when you were, you know, all of a sudden I have this uh, memory from more than 20 years ago when a, a colleague of ours by the name of Mitch Flor, who is German, active in Berlin, and we are part of a, of a kind of a circle of artists, activists at the end of the 90s within the digital community, oh, European digital community at the time. And Mitch Flor was here again, a guest of ICA Sofia, uh, making a presentation about his activities, and he, he related this funny story about the introduction of the telephone to India. So there was this, there was this engineer, a German engineer, who went to, to, uh, to promote the telephone lines, the telephone communication and way of, you know, way of life in a way, to some village in India, in the middle of nowhere. And then he was explaining to people what this machine does. You pick up, you, know, you do this, you do this, and they, they were laughing, and they were like, so what good is it? What, you know, can, what is the use value? Well, imagine you can pick up 
the, the phone and you can call somebody like in a village <laughs> 75 miles away from here. And then everybody started laughing. I said, I said why are you laughing? Well, because we don't know anybody in this world. <laughs> <laughs> why would we call anybody? So it doesn't we don't make that. any it's sense. It's like the same when you go to introduce contemporary art and you start to... No, the, uh, it's really the nice, the nice thing that uh, uh, Yara, for instance, uh, told that story about Scotland. Mm -hmm. And I have heard it in Switzerland about the next valley. Yeah, uh, because they know okay. no they one know in the next one. Well. So, so I guess there there was a school. Yeah, and there was also a music school. Yeah, yeah. and then after the school, what had happened with people? Nothing. People leave to. There if you want to study, you have to yeah, go to one of the nearby cities, big cities. Or so those smaller industrial cities are shrinking as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, before. Yeah. yeah, but obviously if there is production, there are people who are involved. Mm -hmm. in who are staying or yeah. coming back. It's a, a, a or, or arriving in uh, other people. In, in, in Bulgaria there is kind of a trend now also, it, a bit of a trend in decentralization. There are events happening in the northwest, in small villages near the city of Vidin. There are events happening in the south uh, west of, of the country, there, there are very active um, uh, others like uh, not only Plodiv, which is an obvious um, you know, Plodiv, Varna, but Turbo, which is a young city with a lot of students, and in small communities, literally rural areas. And this is a major shift. I mean, contemporary art 20 years ago was considered to be a cosmopolitan and urban phenomenon, and, and it's, uh, now it's, it's, it's really, really changing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but because it's is, the villages which disappear. No, it's not. Uh, no, it's uh, also the the trend which is now uh, now the Documenta 15 just opened and uh, obviously we had we had here two members of the Rwan group at the end of 2019 presenting. But they you know they had no idea what exactly they're going to do except they had the notion of boom boom and sharing and so at the end now they they say that there are 1,500 artists participating in Documenta. And we were asking, is it, would it be possible to, to help us get accommodation for the opening days? And our friends from, uh, from the, the curatorial uh, team, they said, well, please don't ask us. Why? Well, because, we, you know, we have artists, participants are actually <laughs> groups. And each group, imagine a group from coming uh, based in a small city in Haiti or in Vietnam, and they come with the whole village. And they ask for communication. <laughs> they bring all their families, and it's very, very yeah. nice. <laughs> so it's this is like this kind of. <laughs> and in in the whole context of things, documenta is no longer what it used to be. I mean, after, in the last ten years, it has. Are there any it's other <laughs> initiatives alike? I mean, the side of Isolatia, which is connected with Donbass since um, twenty plus years. Um, not of this kind, but uh, yeah, there are suddenly um, quite many residences in rural rural areas organized by enthusiasts, more or less. Yeah, people who uh, manage to get I don't know, a little bit of sponsorship or funding from local business, and they run a small residency. And then there are there are initiatives uh, which are focused much more on um, politics of memory because this is also a kind of a burning issue in, in Ukraine. So uh, they work on like research their local context from the point of view, I don't know, the Jewish history, um, the, the man-made famine, and uh, you know the, all these ethnical conflicts, the, the Second World War II, so all these for, like forgotten narratives, uh, which there are like mm, <laughs> they're endless, I guess. Uh, there are um, quite many initiatives who, who, who focus particularly on that. So I think it's more like uh, the the ecosystem is quite diverse. I have to I have to say and. Uh, um, yeah, and everyone has its its niche, so it's quite nice. Yeah. And you yourself, as a curator, how do you feel after uh, going more and more into the direction of 
community work and activism? Yeah, but that was also a question for me with Isolatia because uh, I like, personally, I like make exhibitions. And at some point I, I started to miss it. Uh, and although I find it extremely important what Isolatia does, for me was maybe was l a little bit less interesting. And then I started a PhD and I realized that I have to focus on that. So it was a, a very natural decision to, uh, f for a while, I guess, to, to stop this active uh, collaboration with Isolatia. Um, and who knows what gonna be what's gonna be next? But uh, yeah, for now I, I only run one project with Isolatia, which is quite small, and uh, yeah, and it's more about uh, it's more about art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All, uh, it's also about uh, LGBT and que queer history in in Ukraine, but it's it's with a means of art. Uh, yeah, so I would like to know more about the issue about empathy because. Um, I can imagine that every artist has a different way of using empathic um, strategies because I think doing art is, can be in general is an empathic way to sink into a material or to sink into community or into mm -hmm. space or into landscape. So I would like to know if, uh, yeah, what was for you the main or the very beautiful moment of ah this is this is empathy and art or this can art be like in an empathic way so I would be interested in that. I reconnected a little bit more with this uh, colleague of mine from Solidar, preparing also for today, and she told me that from these 19 artists and art collectives who went there, there were barely two or three who didn't uh, reach out and who didn't uh, offer help. Everyone else, mm -hmm. there were people collecting uh, funds to provide mm -hmm. food. There were people uh, uh, organizing the delivery. There were, artists so all these artists so i think mm -hmm. this is the at the end this is the most important uh, mm -hmm. uh, moment because uh, none of them remained uh, kind of uh, um, yeah not not involved not interested in isolated. that isolated mm -hmm. yeah they were yeah. they were all and this uh, this girl who made uh, murals on the house of culture she was super engaged and she mm -hmm. is still she she helps uh, a lot, so... But isn't it also ironical and kind of illogical for Isolatia to, be, to remain, to use the, the label Isolatia, when in fact <laughs> what it's doing is completely the opposite? <laughs> yeah, this is one of the internal jokes that we have. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, this this was the name of the for those who don't know. This was the name of the factory, not the name, but the the factory where Isolatia uh, start started uh, produced insulation materials. And in Russian, <laughs> isolation is uh, is also isolation, but also insulation of you know pipes or whatever. So this this is where the name comes from. And of course, it it doesn't represent the institution <laughs> at all. But, yeah, <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah, thank you.